actually like um, there's like Indiegogo rules and there's Kickstarter rules. I think Indiegogo is like all about stretch goals. They tell you set stretch goals, set stretch goals. Um, and I actually just wrote a Kickstarter blog today that said no, 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 stretch goals maybe not such a good idea. Um, but the reason we did it, and it's just because we had our goal of the weekend. I had a call with our PR lady because we're working with the PR firm on Monday, and it was to talk about what our strategy is going into the final week, like what's the angle of our pitch is. And I realized he was like, well, you know, our campaign's funded now. It's like, so what? Like, the story kind of ended there, and we still had a week to go, and we want to kind of take advantage of that. So then, you know, we decided, like, okay, we're going to, so our goal is 25, our new stretch goal is 25K, um, you know, kind of with the new perk for, for contributors. Um, but for me, it was, it all came down to the marketing and the PR angle, which was like, how do you keep the story going? Like, how do you keep it interesting? Because no one's just going to write about a campaign that's funded just because it's funded, like, you know, the, from the marketing angle, it was that pitch needed. Um, but Kickstarter, the blog that I read today, the point about not um, not maybe doing stretch goals was kind of like what you're saying. Um, you don't want to compromise your primary goal by focusing on stretch goals. So if, for example, you know, if you reach you know another 20k, then we'll release it on this other console at the same time. You know, and if you get kind of bogged down in trying to reach your secondary goal, then, you know, you didn't really meet your promise to the people that. You know your first kind of helps you reach your first goal. Um, so I don't know if I would say to do it or not. I, like again, for us, it felt from a PR angle it was good to just kind of keep the momentum going, keep the story fresh. You know, because when you send out a new pitch every time, it has to be a different angle. You can't you can't send the same thing to the same writers. It has to be you know what's new this week. Um, so from that angle, it keeps it keeps it interesting, but at the same time, I guess you don't want to kind of compromise or what your original original. I guess last question, and then we'll, we'll maybe ask a few. If you guys have questions, we're also going to be able to go and stuff and answer uh, other questions. But um, last final thought, uh, really, you guys haven't finished that, uh, but what what would you do differently for the people who have our friends campaign and find you another question? Actually, I'm sorry, the last question. Okay, cool. So uh, why don't we start uh, with the request you guys? What would you do differently? Um, about portrait wars, I wouldn't run a crowdfunding, crowdfunding campaign at all. Uh, that was the lesson learned. It's just not the right kind of game with the right elements to actually leverage it properly. Um, but I uh, really liked uh, you know, the strategies that were demonstrated here. Um, I think that's those are valid ways to have to especially like you know for for a game like ours that has a um, has a following like yours had a following from you know from the old days uh, that gives you a really good uh, leg up because you, your your brand is already out there so if you have something that that's licensed or a remake of something uh, you know you even though it's your maybe your first game you don't have a population to cater to uh, I think that's the, one of the best strategies because Honestly, you can't really depend on Kickstarter if you do if you go to do marketing for you. Um, and that was what we learned on the second time. It's like we have to make sure our people pledge first, and then if that goes well, then maybe you're going to get featured. Maybe other people are going to notice us that remember trade wars from uh, so, so that's really a good lesson. Uh, and I totally do that with another title, with that in mind, with other licensing kind of you know, that's where we can't really say what we say uh, that kind of thing. Um, so th that's the kind of projects that we go with uh, if I go to the second try. Um, anything about uh, Yeah, I, don't, I have one that I used to lost. Um, but, but there are things that we could have done better. Rewards should have been like hammered down. There should have been eight of them, not 12, 15, whatever it was. Um, I would have done a different video. Probably, only because it was so polarizing, um, and uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, our prices were off. There's just, just little things that we just, because we were doing it as we went, we didn't have the benefit of, of the second time through um, to make it, uh, to just make it more effective. I had a, a really much better reason to <laughs> think of it some other time. Watching so close that we didn't have enough time to do it in advance. But, um, like, obviously, it's a big PR um, publicity. So, I would say that, like, this 
stuff that you don't want to do, but like wanting to press up beforehand, like emailing people and like tweeting at people and building a relationship with like those journalists beforehand. Because if you email them, you know, the day of your launch or the second day, and they've never heard from you before, you know, like their inboxes are crazy. So you know, your chances of getting picked up are kind of really slim. Whereas if you know, in the months leading up, you know, you start just little things. You start a conversation on Twitter. You you know, maybe email them something based on their last article. Or there's all kinds of like. PR like shenanigans that you're supposed to do, and we didn't really want to do it. We were working with the PR firm, so we thought we could just kind of bypass it. But in hindsight, I wish we would have spent like the two or three months leading up into it, really like really getting our PR down, um, getting our press down, having stories ready to go on launch day. Like you know, the two weeks leading up to it, having the stories embargoed and ready to go like at 8 a.m. on the launch day, so that you you have a really front-loaded campaign, and you know, if you have a really good first day, at least to a good second day. Like, the momentum of those first uh, couple days is like really, really crucial. And we had like a rude awakening because for Indigo, you know, there's like there's always you know there's the new this week and then there's the last countdown. So again, so, you know, your first week is going to be good, your last week is going to be good. And as soon as we dropped off the new this week, it was like you know no you know it was trough of death or despair, whatever you're calling it. Real, that's really what it was. It's like all of a sudden you know nothing was coming in. It was like no one was talking about us. Um, and I said I really would have <clears throat> excuse me like on the press ready so that first week was just you know full thing like hit after hit and, you know you really front load your campaigns so that you know the first couple of days of momentum just kind of carry carry you further. That was it. That was it. So my whole idea was to defeat statistics. This whole thing like this, I'm like, no, that's not gonna be us. We're gonna be like this the whole time. Right in the middle. Not up, not down, just get a consistent, predictable flow of income. And we still did this, but it was a little bit wonky because we were trying to play with it. Every couple of days we had a new thing that we released like the second day we were the third day was like disaster pieces on board and then we waited till Friday to say that Yoshisa Kishimoto was on board as the creator of Double Dragon, um, Justin Sear from Scott Bilbo vs. The World, Nina Matsumoto, um, the, the rewards. We tried to kind of like parcel it out but it's all about like net of network effects. If, if it's good the first day it'd be even better the second day because it was so good those two days. Like so I think yeah fire all the cannons. Don't leave anything back for that last minute. Oh, by the way, if you're if you've got stuff that's good to talk about, you should have it. And we had it all lined up ahead of time, and it was and also it's really stressful because you're like, should I should I tell them or not? And then you know you spend way too much time thinking about it. So you know what? Do your best campaign, put it on the front page, press publish, and then just deal with like you know you still have to have updates, but do it more about content like do like the history of your game or do interviews do some social stuff because you need to have that real-time feedback things didn't really pick up until we had like a constant like our Facebook and our Twitter was live all the time we're always doing live streams and stuff that you know we kind of did all of our strategic plays and then there was no time left so or there's nothing left to say so we went into social mode and that's when it picked up why not fire all your things at once and go right into social mode right away and just start talking to other people I think that would have made a difference uh, I think at least we would have hit our goals um, sooner and you know, and that's good for you because there, no one tells you how uh, physically, mentally draining it is to write a Kickstarter, and how little sleep you get. I don't even. I don't think you've stopped having. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is, like, you know, you have to sleep. You have to eat well. I did not. I'm dealing with it now. Um, the, the point is, is that it, it is a lot harder than it sounds, and it's uh, it's in a place of vulnerability. So you have to really um, be prepared for to have all sorts of feelings of inadequacy, stress, all those things. It's, it's really, really hard. It is really hard. But at the end of it, you come out a lot better. You learn a lot of things about marketing and yourself. And, and you should do it even if you fail, I think, because it will teach you things. And you know, your campaign is not just a 30 or 40 days, then you're running it for it's, it's the six months leading up to it as well. I think those are very important, and you need to be prepped for it. Uh, it's otherwise. just the beginning. Now we have 5,000 customers who want to know how we're doing. <laughs> Almost every day. It's hard. It's hard because you, you, you're so grateful for them. Um, but you also have to ship the game too. And we have five, like we're like four people, core and six people helping, but we don't really have customer service. So I answer every email about whether this you know, add-on works with this, and what t-shirt size is it going to be. You know, And that's time that I was supposed to be writing the engine that I didn't factor into my production time. So 
you have to scramble a bit. It's hard. So there's like the trough of despair, but there's also like the post-success vortex. <laughs> so there's, there's two things that are like the same. I guess we'll finish up with the thing. Anything yeah, you want to change at this point? No, the, the points that they made were all very, very good. Um, getting back to the stretch goals, one of the good things about having stretch goals is giving the, the people who are pledging to your product an idea of what you'll do in the case where you get more than your goal. Because if you say, okay, my goal is 100K, and then you end up making a million, what is that other 900K going to? It's not just going in your pocket. We want to know that it'll be towards something. And that gives more reason for people who come to the product after it's been successfully funded, while it's still running, to be like, okay, well, they already made their goal, but I want to play this on my PS4 and not on my PC, so I'm going to give money because I want them to reach that goal. That's one of the advantages, but yeah, um, excellent points what Dan said about trickling out things and having things in advance prepared as to what you're going to feed your your pledgers while the campaign is running to keep the interest there. So there's um, a lot of pressure there. Uh, so for us, um, I don't know if I'm a good example of that because I have to get this game. I have got to get this game done. And I'm sure that's, that's how everyone feels when they're, when they're working on it. But game projects routinely in the industry go over their budget and over their time. And that's probably why a lot of people got into indie because of the fact that there's so many um, you know constraints and issues with, with, with AAA. And I don't have enough experience with these guys to do. Um, but I think that as long as, I mean, I think that as soon as you know, you, that you're being honest, like we have, we're still sort of on track, but if we don't hit our first playable prototype uh, milestone by December 31st, we'll tell people. We'll let them know we're, getting, we're running behind. We'll let them know why. Um, we'll let them know that our SDL to, to mono game revamped didn't go the way we wanted it to, or that literally I'm spending too much time on the campaign logistics, um, and it hasn't calmed down yet, and that's why I'm a month late. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. I think people, because people want to be a part of it, they want to be a part of it in the good times, but I think there's some kind of camaraderie and being part of it in the bad times. Certainly, I don't think any of the projects, because you can handle it two ways. Like some of the projects that are frustrating you right now, they're probably going, they're probably scared to tell their backers <laughs> they're running behind. It's like, because they feel, A, um, Kickstarter changed their terms of service so that now the project owners are now legally liable to ship the thing. Um, so people could technically, you know, do a little mini, um, you know, class action and get their money back. Um, so that's scary. But the, the other thing, you know, I think that people will be way more lenient when they understand what's going on, and you continuously share as much as you have. You know, I mean, I don't know. Would that make you feel better if I was like, if, if his T-shirt's late? Are you gonna? Well, I know what he is now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was mostly a fact that RTS. brought up on the campaign page 
fully realize that you were looking at full gameplay of what looked like it was a damn near finished product. And then 18 months later, you know, 15 months later, I'm like, okay, I'd really like to play that game that I wanted to play last year. That would be cool. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Maybe you could talk about the industry. Oh, we will limit though, with one person, just because we are running a little bit late. Oh, that's cool. Um, is there a general like markup percentage you're looking for for between like the reward and the pledge amount? So like how much the cost of a t-shirt and then how much the pledge uh, you're looking for for that t-shirt? Is there a general like markup percentage you're looking for? Well, I mean, it's simple to manage, really. I mean, if you, uh, usually if you give out t-shirts, I mean, the more t-shirts that are pledged on, the cheaper the per t-shirt's going to be. Well, so okay. you need to know, like, maybe not a t-shirt, maybe something else like... Well, a anything, right? I mean, yeah. You got to be able to raise money, so you have to make sure that your uh, the pledge amount is going to be way superior to the amount of the swag that you're giving away. Um, otherwise, I mean, so, so you always have to calculate, you do a little math, evaluate well, how much of that chunk that I'm raising I actually have to spend to give away the swag. So I have to do that math, and then if you do it properly, then you're, uh, you know, you know, saying about the, the pledge amounts. It's pretty important to actually figure that out. <laughs> we didn't do any planning whatsoever. We screwed it up. Right now, the tangible rewards are, are tracking the cost 10% of the budget. Um, I don't know if that's average or not, but I think higher margin would have been better. Um, but yeah, we made it up as we went along. So, do research as far as uh, what other Kickstarter. Um, campaigns will offer for the rewards, get like a few uh, things like similar to what you're trying to make, so if you're making a game, get a couple game ones, see what they do, what the prices are, and also how many of them actually sell, because you can see for each reward level, how many of those actually sell. More often than not, the higher ones, like when you're in the thousands, of course, you know, the, the curve drops off, there's less chance of you selling that tier. Of course, there's always the outliers, like, oh, I'm a company, and uh, I love this thing, and here's a thousand dollars, it's great. It doesn't happen in the thousands that that many people will do it. And one small trick is a lot of people do $100 for the t-shirt. That's simply because you want to have a wall between physical and digital. So have as many like digital things, but then I think $100, well it sounds like a lot for a t-shirt, that's actually like the price of margin to get you over into thinking about things like shipping. Um, that did help us. We, we stole that off uh, Death Road to Canada. They had a $100 t-shirt and we're like, that makes a lot of sense. That way we can have this like nice clean barrier between what we think we'll sell the most of, and then all of the kind of get into exotic reward territory once you cross $100. I don't know, that, was, that worked out for us. Um, you know, we're going to print, our, our t shirts are the most expensive rewards, going to cost us like six grand. I talked to them, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's someone back there. Uh, yeah, I want to take the last question. Please. Um, yeah, this is more to that spirit that you're talking about. Um, so recently I was tasked with doing a Kickstarter, and it ended up being cancelled after about three months of development. And the reason was, we have another source of funding. So um, my point is, how do you think that works with having alternative sources, crowdfunding? Because you're talking about how you sort of want it to be the necessary component to finishing your budget. But if you can get a supplementary piece, is it disingenuous to your users to have both of them running at the same time? And is it like, would you consider it fair to do that? It all depends on what you're promising to give them. If you're promising to give them a certain amount and you already have funding for it, then you have to give them, you know, like, if you fund us, then this is why we're asking for the money. You have to tell them, you have to be honest as to your motives, as like, this is why we're asking for the money. We can handle the development of the game, but we want to include this portion of it, or we want to reach this platform, whatever that may be, that's how you have to approach it, you have to be honest with it. And maybe if I can just add to that, um, so we had a physical product, uh, but what happened is during the Kickstarter, because it got, uh, not, we did Indiegogo, uh, but you know, during that time, because it got so successful, we had a lot of investors approaching us because we proved the market, we proved that we were going to be successful, we proved that we, you know, so you can also use a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo project to actually prove to investors that this this will happen. So you can sure ask for, for you know, 20K instead of 100K, uh, and then once you have that, it, it sort of proves to whoever you're going to go seek for that extra amount of money to cover the rest. 
uh, you're not asking too much, you might over exceed it, and then next thing you know, you have all these people who want to give you money because you've already proven them that what you've got is successful. Um, yeah, we, we have three publishers who came out of the woodwork and said, we'll just do this, you guys cancel your Kickstarter. And, uh, I think you're right, I think what you do is the right thing. I think a lot of people um, may not do that, so it's, it's good to have a moral compass, like, you know, because that's the whole point of it. Like, it's, it's, it's authentic. Um, and um, we, we're still going to pursue alternative sources of funding, not for the, the game that we promised, like the Windows, Mac, or Linux. But I think a lot of people were disappointed we didn't hit our stretch goals. So we feel like there's an imperative for us to go out and see if we can find money for the consoles um, to get them all so that the people don't have to worry about like they want to play it on Nintendo 3DS, etc. I think that we're doing that for, for those people that felt ripped off, but like this really small group of people called Nintendo Wii U users, and they're really, really passionate, um, and they hate us because we didn't like make that stretch goal. So we're pursuing alternative sources of funding now that people know who we are, but no one wanted to talk to us at all. Unknown video game company makes fan game, you know, leverages house to buy license. I think that didn't happen, but the point, the point is like, I think that's good. I think that you should have a, you should make the right decision. You shouldn't try to get more money than you need. And canceling is probably good, the best idea in your case because because people people can smell like disingenuous. You know what I mean? People can figure that stuff out. So it probably was better for you for your brand. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. So thanks to our panelists. Just to remind you that.